Hey, it's Tim Kawakami here, 49ers plus minus recording on Wednesday afternoon of the 49ers first practice of training camp. Here we go, Barrows. I'm here with my co-host, Matt Barrows. Okay, you get through that whole Wrexham Chelsea traffic. By the way, I am wondering if that possibly wasn't a hidden reason why Trent Williams wasn't there. He couldn't get there. The streets are blocked. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the joke. He was stuck somewhere in the yellow lot during practice today. He actually tried to report, but... <laughs> okay we had a little glitch there barrow so you are you back with me i am okay we we had a one-time glitch it will not happen again uh <laughs> <laughs> i promise i promise to myself uh all right barrow's first impressions so the first back no trent williams uh wants a new contract i guess he's holding out we can officially call it a hold out Forever long at last. Brandon Ayuk was there uh, in a hold in, not practicing, uh, made a nice slow walk past everybody, which the great cinematographer Matt Barrows caught. I guess you wandered up up the bleachers and caught the kind of the uh, panoramic vision, uh, including myself there, kind of not really looking as, as Ayuk walked past me. Um, anything to strike you there, or is it on the football field? What's the first thing that that kind of hits you after this first day? Well, that sequence began with Ayuk. Ayuk was down by the water coolers, say around the um, the forty yard line on that on that other forty yard line. He had a towel over his head. You 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 didn't know who he was unless some, you were told by somebody, which I was. So I was kind of watching him, and then he walked down the other end of the field and started circling the field, that um, south end of the field, and then he ran into John Lynch. And he and Lynch had a conversation, and that's when he started to walk the other way past all of us. And then I followed, um, and he met up with Lynch again at the headquarters building, and they went both went into the, the building, presumably into Lynch's office there. And they were there for 45 minutes. So I don't know whether it was just a another kind of uh, taking the temperature type of meeting. I thought that maybe something had happened um one way or the other but um that that wasn't the case but it was sort of an odd uh sequence and then my point is that Ayuk took the time to walk past all of us yeah no question and said something to a cameraman somebody with a camera mm -hmm. whereas lynch sort of took the short way and so they they met up again at a different point um <laughs> uh, but uh that would be par for the course for brandon Ayuk, who has done a good job of kind of milking this um and, and trying to kind of coax it in his direction really since the end of the season when he had a very lugubrious you know didn't know whether he was going to get traded didn't know what was going to happen i thought it was sort of odd my antenna was uh, was raised at that point and it's been that way ever since he's very good with a stagecraft that brandon Ayuk. like he does things that you notice i think this was clearly like he wanted everyone no doubt he wanted everyone to see it and I don't know what that wholly means. Who, you know, is that positive? Is that he still like has to do these things in order? I, I don't know, but I'll just say it's probably better. You know, if you're hoping that he comes in and signs with foreigners, it's better that he's there than he's not yeah. there. Uh, I think my sense is that, um, you know, he's kind of like, there's a path to a deal in, in his mind. Doesn't mean it's going to happen. Doesn't mean like the 49ers are sure what that thing is or what the number is. If he wasn't sure that he saw a path to a deal, he wouldn't be there. I don't think he would. Uh, and Kyle Shanahan mentioned, you know, you know, you, you do it because you don't want to get fined, but they could rescind the fines because he's on his rookie deal the same way they rescinded the fines for Nick Bosa. However, they cannot rescind the fines for someone who's not on his rookie deal. Who would be who? That would be Trent Williams, who is not there. Um, you know, this one seems easier to me. I'm writing a column about this. It, like the IU thing, I can see it's long-term money. It's how much are you paying another receiver? I, I would pay him if I'm them, but I get that it could be thorny. I mean, Trent Williams, you want on the team. You want him to say, give me two years, right? You want him to continue playing if you think he's playing at that level. They can do the same similar thing they did with Christian McCaffrey, just kind of guarantee him another year. Like you are not, he's not guaranteed any money. Understandable. He wants that guaranteed. You're going to want to pay him anyway. It's Trent Williams. So, I don't see that one as a tricky one. I don't know. Do you see some possible issues with Trent Williams? 
Only the the issue being that you know you, you have all this money already tied up, um, and uh, Ayuk is is gunning for money at the same time. Now you talked about the fines for Trent Williams. I believe that Trent Williams probably has fifty thousand dollars somewhere in his sofa cushions. Um, I mean, Trent, Trent Williams has done very well with his money, so um, I don't think he's sweating the fines. And to your point, it probably won't last very long. Um, the other part about Trent Williams is sort of akin to Nick Bosa last year. I mean, if you want everybody in camp, you want everybody practicing as much as they can. But if you were to pick some guys that could miss some time and, and kind of pick things up pretty pretty readily uh, with uh, a few weeks left uh, before the season starts, Trent Williams is one of those guys. Um, I didn't think that uh, Jalen Moore, who was the left tackle today, I watched him get beat on um, successive plays, one by Yatur uh, Gross Matos, uh, backup defensive end. And then on the next, next play, uh, Nick Bosa came in uh, and lined up at his usual right defensive end spot. And he also got some pressure on the quarterback. So, I mean, that's what's at stake here. Uh, Trent Williams knows it. I don't think he's, I mean, I, he, he's such a veteran that I, I don't think this is, um, you know, he, he's not trying to show anybody up. He was there in the spring, for example. He's not here because he knows that he can just kind of fly in on his private jet and, and pick up um, whenever he needs to. So, um, yeah, I agree with you. I, I think it's something that they could work out. It's something that they're motivated to work out. The uh, the IUK one might be a little trickier. I, I think it's notable that Debo Samuel also showed up a couple of years ago at training camp absent a deal. That seemed like it was, you know, on its way to, to occurring, but he didn't sign right away. We talked about this. I think it was August 1. They started later that year. But, um, again, this is still – taking the shape of the uh, the Debo Samuel negotiation. Shanahan did mention that, you know, hey, Trent can miss a few practices. Like, they didn't say it like like Boza last year. It was like, oh, Boza. Oh, we don't need Boza in. Like, hey, he's going to keep himself in great shape. We don't need Boza. And I think that backfired on them. Like, they didn't feel the pressure. And maybe, it, you know, it. I, Nick Bosa said it slowed him down to start the season. He just didn't have that same kind of rhythm uh, and maybe he was trying to kind of make up for lost time in the regular season when he reports what the Tuesday of the regular season, whatever that was. Um, I don't think they're going to say the same thing with Trent Williams. I'll put it that way. And they sure won't say the same thing for Brandon. Are you so oh, no, we don't need him. Oh, like you can, you want guys in camp. You just want guys in camp. They don't have to practice every day, but you want them in that mindset. So the fact that Ayuk is there at least around the guys in the locker room, uh, again, a positive, a positive thing. Guess God, you know what? Who was the starting uh, receiver opposite Debo Samuel without uh, without Brandon Ayuk there? But I'm trying. Who was that? Uh, who was that, Matt Barrows? I think it was your guy, number 84, Chris Conley. Oh, who has changed and... numbers? He was changed numbers, by the way. He's 18 now, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess that's right. Um, you, you've been uh, on the Conley bandwagon for almost a year now. Yeah. Um, Since last year's and... camp. Last year's camp. Last year's camp. And uh, yeah, I mean, and he, he came on at the end. I mean, he had a, a heck of a playoffs and really um, showed up on special teams in, in the Super Bowl. Remember how great he was on punt coverage in that game. That would have been a great special teams game. And if it hadn't been for a wayward punt that hit the back of Darrell Luter's leg. But um, yeah, he, he was there. I thought Danny Gray, he caught a couple passes from Brock Purdy today. Um, you know, the... Um, the silver lining to all this is that you get, you know, snaps with, uh, with the younger guys, um, less, lesser used guys like Conley, uh, they get more reps and they get to show off what they can do. Um, no Ricky Pearsall today. He's dealing with a hamstring injury. He should be back in some form. I think he'll probably get eased in a little bit next week. Um, and then they lost another rookie to what seemed like a, a hamstring strain in Isaac Garendo, who's somebody who battled, hamstring injuries all throughout uh, college when he was at Wisconsin. Those, those fast guys um, just have soft no tissue. trouble yeah, keeping soft those tissue. hammies uh, yeah. in shape. Yeah. I mean, this would have been a huge time for, for Ricky Pearsall, right? No, no Ayuk. You don't want to have Debo run every route. You've got some other guys and you just want to see how Pearsall fits. And like, like we saw him in mini camp or we saw him, even though in mini camp, we saw him with the, what the red Jersey, right? There was something going on with him. 
Um, so, you know, that's something to keep in, keep in mind. I thought Garendo, you know, listen, it's a ramp up practice, no pads. People are just touching, no tackling, but, but I thought Garendo looked really he would be when big, he's fast, um, and he's going to have some injury issues. But what'd you think of Garendo before he got hurt? Yeah, he, he took a, a, a swing pass on one play and, and zipped up the field. I mean, I thought that, you know, a, a lot of uh, time is going to be spent on this new kickoff rule and how the 49ers address that. I, I just think that he's perfect for kickoffs. What you want is a big, fast guy who can make sudden cuts and, and get up to speed. Um, so uh, and I'm sort of looking forward to him in that regard. Uh, th- this seems like it's going to be an injury that that lingers. He's going to be out for a little while. So uh, we probably won't see that. So it'll be interesting to see who does get those kick returner snaps. Is it going to be two kick returners? How many guys are going to be back there? Uh, they seem to always do punt returns when we're watching it. So we haven't seen a lot of what they're thinking about as far as kickoff rules. It might be that the preseason, which is usually very useless for us, um, but uh, I mean, they have to do the kickoffs in that game. So, um, I think that that might be one of the more interesting points to kind of watch how they're trying to tackle these new rules. Uh, I think you wrote about Brock Purdy right today. I saw the headline. I'm sorry. I was writing my own column, but, uh, questions about his size, questions about his, you know, his arm looking pretty good. what do you think about Purdy today? Yeah. I mean, Purdy's been, um, in control since the spring. I mean, I was really impressed with him in the spring. He didn't have IU, didn't have Juwan Jennings for a big stretch. So he's throwing to, um, not his usual starters and it's just, a a, a command that, I mean, I, I don't want to say that we haven't seen from him before. Um, we really haven't had an opportunity to see it, um, in, in previous years. Cause uh, he was the number three or num- number four guy. I forget what it was. Number back four in- to start and number yeah, two years 22. ago. So he wasn't getting any reps back then. And then last year he was on the two on one off um, program. So um, he's in, he's in command uh, mentally. Um, he uh, acknowledged that he added a couple pounds in weight, something I've written about in the past. He's, um, you know, he, the, uh, Shanahan joked about him being baby Bosa today as far as his quads, his thighs. And that was a hindrance to him at Iowa State. He did sort of like college weightlifting then, sort of meathead weightlifting. You just got big and he got his he got his legs really big. But the quads took over his throwing motion to a degree that you didn't want. Um, and he's been sort of unlearning that since um uh, his college career ended and he's learned how to kind of use his hips instead. He's got a really big, strong lower body. That's how he generates power. Um, he's just going to kind of tweak his, uh, his movements a little bit. And he continued that process. Wasn't able to do that last year because of the elbow, but went to Jacksonville, worked with his throwing coach, Will Hewlett and said he added a little bit more zip as well. So um, I think that that's probably a, uh, a positive thing as well. Certainly positive for his, his confidence back there. Um, so all, all, uh, all thumbs up uh, when it comes to the most important guy in the field. It's interesting. You know, you got all these young guys are fast guys. A lot of Danny Gray hasn't done much in two seasons. You've got Cowings, the rookie, you've got some fast, you know, Pearsall has got some speed if he was out there. Um like, can they hit the deep ball, right? Can And they did not in this practice. They tried one a couple times, but I think there was some defensive offsides and some some mishaps. But can they find somebody running alone deep? Uh, don't see it much in practice. Don't see it a ton in games. I think they're interested in doing it. Like, I think they'd like to try. Uh, I think Purdy has, you know, he doesn't have Justin Herbert arm strength, but he's got the arm strength to hit somebody open downfield. Um, I'd be curious, like, can Danny Gray do something like that? Can't, you know, they've been looking for someone who can just go deep cowings, whoever, um, you know, they're going to call it and l- let's see if they can do it. Yeah. I mean, that's been part of Shanahan's offense throughout. And you didn't mention your guy, uh, Conley, he's still got speed. I mean, yep, that's why yep. he was making those plays on, on punt coverage. He was down the field faster than, than everybody else. Um, you know, Purdy's done well as far as the deep ball. It's it's how you measure the deep ball. Um, I think uh, you know 
pass plays of 20 yards or more. He's really good and, and way better than Jimmy Garoppolo was. Jimmy, Jimmy wouldn't even uh, attempt those throws. Um, but I, I think you're talking more about sort of a, a Don Coriel, you know, Lynn Swan, John Stallworth, like deep bombs, like bombs that really, really open up the field. Um, and, and I think um, Shanahan would love to do that. I mean, that's why you, you talk to Danny Gray. Um, and, um, you know, that, that opens up all those middle routes, which are really the, the, the bread and butter for Shanahan. So, yeah, for sure, he'd love to do that. And I think that um, Purdy, he doesn't have uh, a Dan Fouts arm, but his recognition is such that, you know, he, he might be able to kind of see that coming open a touch earlier and take advantage of it. I don't know. Um, but um, yeah, I agree with you. I think that's certainly something that, that Shanahan would love to to add to this offense. They want the threat of it, at least, right? They'd have to play it. You know, Baltimore can't pull those safeties up and just layer the middle of the field and jump every middle around. Just make them have to back up some. Uh, so, so we'll see. Uh, again, it's first practice, uh, you know, not a lot to see, uh, you know, other than, yeah, the offensive line did not look great, but obviously there's some reasons for that. Uh, McCaffrey did not practice in team drills. So you got the first team offense without McCaffrey, without Ayuk, and without Trent Williams. Like, it's just going to look different, especially if you've got Bosa on the other side, Fred Warner on the other side, Javarius Ward on the other side. It's going to be a little difficult for anything to be open. The Sobert, wasn't Sobert your tight end guy, right? He makes a big play. That was a hell of a play. Telling you, if you, you get that from your blocking tight end, that's okay. a uh, that's a nice bonus. Yeah, I, I truly believe that Sobert – is going to be the number two guy, or at least get the second most tight end snaps um, after Kittle because he can block. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's a dog as a blocker. I, I, you could you could tell that in the spring even when they weren't in full pads. So um, yeah, don't don't sleep on Eric Salbert. He's gonna he's gonna have like a uh, a Garrett Selleck type of year where he has some like key catches. I mean that's something that they really didn't get from Charlie Warner. Warner was great. I mean, he's a good blocker. He was great on special teams, but boy, they just they just never targeted him in the, in the passing game. Um, and I, I'm not exactly sure why. But if you can, if if Eric Saubert had, I'm going to say a really low number, like 15 catches this year, I think they would consider that a total oh, total 15. win. Like one a game out of Eric Sauber. There you go. There you <laughs> if he go. can play, if he can play special teams, he's on the team. Like, like he's on the team if he can play special. I think he can. Most of those backup tight ends can. He looks athletic enough. Then he's on the team. Uh, I've already marked him down. Conley's on the team, by the way. I mean, he might have to go back and forth on the practice squad, but he's on the team. Uh, we're we're ready to declare in that. Uh, I hate to do this and bring up my own thing, but I Barrows, want you to. I yeah, want I had you a little to. conversation with a relatively important person yesterday, uh, an annual conversation I do with Kyle Shanahan, who loves to put it like the last possible moment he can do it is after the media press conference he and John Lynch do to open uh, training camp and before the team meeting. There's a little window, and that's I know if he we don't do it, then we're not doing it because he's not doing it during the season. So he likes pushing it then, but he does give me the time to do it, and I always appreciate it. Uh, and we had a pretty good conversation uh, and talk, try to talk like bigger picture things just because like he can be expansive when he sits down. He kind of wants to be. He's not going to be just kind of bat, beat back your question quickly. He wants to talk it through. Uh, Barros, what are your thoughts on that one? What, what was the most interesting thing you got out of that? Well, I mean, the, the Bill Belichick one is is the headliner there. And um, uh, when they let go of Wilkes, one of my athletic assignments, something that we do is, you know, come up with a list of possible D.C. replacements. And I know Belichick at the top of the list. It was an alphabetical list. And I remember feeling very sort of sheepish about it because – it seemed clicky mm-hmm. check up there, but my rationale was, I mean, if he's available and they have a relationship with him, like Kyle Shanahan does uh, after the, the Jimmy Garoppolo uh, trade in 2017, you, you at least make the call. And it turns out that's exactly what happened. Um, and I, I, I think that's uh, you, you have to, I mean, you're almost compelled to at least check in with him to see Um did he say anything about Pete Carroll as a? Uh, no, I could have asked that again. I was on a limited bit, little bit of a time that's limit. True. No, for, so yeah, like, you did great with the. Yeah, the yeah time exactly. Like, I'm kind of like trying to have the conversation flow, but also I got to get to this topic. I got to get to this topic. So I didn't really go. I mean, you know, I, my follow up was was he 
offered defensive coordinator, like specifically. And he goes, yeah, it was offered everything. Uh, I, I knew they were, you know, I'd talked to Kyle. You might have already too. Like he, he and Belichick are kindred spirits. They really respect each other. Kyle really values the fact that, uh, you know, Bill Belichick <laughs> respects him. Like that means a lot to him. Yeah. They've had, they've had really deep conversations, including as, as Shannon has said, like one of the first guys to call him after losing that Super Bowl when he was a Falcons offensive coordinator up 23. We know the story was Bill Belichick, who was the coach who beat him uh, and talked about how hard it was to play Shanahan's offense. So that's why I asked it. I, I, I knew he'd talk to him. I thought it might have been more for the Staley job, you know, just kind of a new set of eyes, somebody that I can bounce things off of. And then when he was talking, I go, God, he must have offered defense. The way he's talking, he must have offered defensive coordinator. So I asked him. He goes, Yeah, uh, it it does talk to kind of Shanahan's security, right? His sense of self. A lot of guys, I think most head coaches would not want to bring in a six-time Super Bowl winning champion. Gruff, you know, does his own way. Personnel, you know, basically, you know, has been, run his own show for twenty-four years. And Kyle Shannon was like, sure, I'm going to ask him. That's absolutely what I'm going to do. Um, I just think it speaks to his sense of security, his sense of confidence. I can hang with the big guys. In fact, the big guys might want to come with me. So um, that's what I really gather from that. And the other spin is, that you know, go to back to the Tom Brady call last year when Purdy's, you know, about to have the elbow surgery. They're sold on Purdy. He's the guy. But they call Tom Brady, ask him, you want to do one one year? And he didn't want to. But. You in the Kyle Shanahan mind, that was showing support for Purdy because yeah. he wouldn't do it with Jimmy Garoppolo. Like he did not feel that Jimmy Garoppolo could take it in twenty nine, going to twenty twenty, and he felt that Brock Purdy could. You know, just to, that that explains a lot about Kyle Shanahan's brain that he respects the guy that he might replace for a year because he knows that guy can take it. Uh, that those are the two things I got from there. Many other things we can talk about from that conversation, but. Uh, those two Patriot guys are tied to, to, to this 49ers era. They just are. And uh, I was glad I got it all down in a conversation with Shanahan. Well, the other thing that jumped out to me, and, and um, this was about the offensive line, and mm-hmm. um, you know, Chris Furster sort of foreshadowed Shanahan's response to you, which is essentially that we can have sort of um, a less than stellar offensive line if we've got really great um, – you know, weaponry around us, great receivers and and great running backs and a great quarterback. And, um, you know, certainly Mike Shanahan's Denver Broncos teams um, uh, fit that uh, description. And he brought up the Washington team, which ran for a ton of yards. Um, That was the uh, RG3 and Alfred Morris rookie year team. And um, Shanahan's point was we rushed for more yards than the Hogs did (laughs) back then. Um, and my, and I get what he's saying. Uh, and I think this is a little bit of a, um, he, Shanahan did not have a great time in Washington. No. And so it's a little bit of a, um, uh, you know what to the Washington franchise and to the Washington fans and everything else. But I don't think he's quite right on that because for one reason, um, a lot of those rushing yards came from RG3. Yes, yes. And by the end of the season, RG3 was beat up and hurt, and they lost in the first round of the playoffs. And um, so, you know, a lot of those yards were sort of manufactured uh, and and not really sustainable over time. Uh, And the, the second part of that is that the Hogs went to four Super Bowls and won three of them with sort of uh, less than stellar quarterbacks. They were Joe Theismann, Doug Williams at the very end of his career, and Mark Rippon. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of the inverse of what Shanahan is describing. You spend a lot of resources on your offensive line, and you can get away with less than stellar uh, skill players. Um, and Shanahan is saying the opposite. I mean, both are true, but um, – I'll tell you, you know, the, those Washington teams won Super Bowls. Uh, the, the the Washington team that he coached um, went to the playoffs, you know, maybe once or twice and, and didn't go very deep. See, which team did you cheer for growing up there? I'm trying to remember. Well, I happen to know quite a bit about <laughs> the Hogs is all. 
<laughs> Joe Jacoby was like your like your uh, your uh, your hero growing up. No, I know Joe it was there. Star, I know it was Jeff Bostick, Joe Jacoby, Mark May. Yeah. Jim, now, Jim now, not a lot, maybe I think May was a first round pick. Lachey was they traded for Lachey. Yeah, but like it's not like Jacoby was like a six round pick, right? He was a late oh, yeah. round pick. Yeah, some yeah. of those guys were were kind of moved in there like that. Um, but I just think you get the sensibility there that, like he's saying, like you trade Trent Williams, absolutely, but it's got to be Trent Williams. And some of these guys that are thought to be the fifteenth pick or the twentieth pick, that consensus is so safe, so easy to take one of these guys, no one's going to rip you for aren't going to give you, you know, aren't going to score you touchdowns. They aren't going to, they're, they're not special. You can get a guy like that in the second round. He said second round. Like, I feel like that. you don't even take him in the second round, Kyle. Like you take him in the third, the fifth, the set, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I get the point. And we talked a little bit about this after the, the show, but same stuff. And, um, you know, it's, it's how he feels. Like he wants guys who score touchdowns. He wants guys who sack the quarterback. He wants guys who, you know, and also it's their system, right? Their system, the old 49er system was similar. Like they're not stacking that offensive line with first round picks, winning those Super Bowls during the dynasty. A few high picks, but not nothing crazy. Um, and it was the same kind of movement, Bob McKittrick, right? It was not the outside zone, but it was similar to it. And they kind of take that to Denver. Mike Shanahan, and Mike Shanahan gives it to Kyle, and they're running this. And it's not the same stuff that everyone drafts. It's not the 350-pound right tackle. They got to move. Guys got to move. Guys, you know, it's teamwork. It's rhythm. It's flow. And I just, it's just clear from what Furster said and clearly what from Kyle said, they don't think they have to draft for that. They don't have to use a 20th pick in the draft for that. Again, if Penny Sewell was sitting there for them, they would take them. But there aren't that many of those guys who make a difference to them every year. But you do, you know, they got one, Trent Williams, and they're going to need another one at some point. Like that is what kind of my argument is. You, so maybe you don't think the guy in the first round or early second round is that guy, but you got to keep draft some of them to see if you have a shot at it. And see, Kyle's he, he's just unlikely to do that because that guy might be a Ricky Pearsall, right? Or, or might be turn into Brandon Ayuk or, or turn into somebody that he can use a score instead of like just kind of stand in front in front of somebody instead of wiping him out. Look at that guy. Oh my God, he just blew him up. Larry Allen, or whoever other the great lineman. Well, if you just stand in front of them, it's kind of same. like Christian McCaffrey just needs somebody to stand in front of somebody. If I can figure out how to do that and the angle, then I can draft the guy in the fourth round. I think that's – and I, I wanted to ask him for that answer, I, and I now I have that answer. So this is what that's good about this conversation. I just – we got the answer. Like for things that we've questioned and guessed at and wondered, we got an answer. And I think that was as thorough an answer as I can ask for. Uh, I don't think it made 49er fans thrilled – who still want that tackle, and I get why, but they score a lot of points and they gain a lot of yards, and they don't that's you know they don't fill up their offensive line with first round, second round picks. At some point, you have to understand that and understand that's his mentality, and quit banging your head against the wall when he's not going to do it. Uh, Jalen Moore, who's mm-hmm. their de facto starter at left tackle, well, Trent Williams is out. He was a fifth round pick, and so their argument is that you know. We can find a Jalen Moore and the difference between a Jalen Moore and somebody we could have taken at the end of the first round or the second round is there there might be a difference there, but it's less than the difference between the receiver we can get at those positions and the receiver we can get in the fifth round. Um, And it's probably right. I mean, Jalen Moore um, is serviceable, maybe slightly more than serviceable. Um, he, he moves well. Um, he's also, uh, going to be a free agent in March. So, you know, e- even if he develops this year and takes off, um, they're, they're not going to pay him. Uh, so, um, yeah, it, it still means that they need to find some, some depth at that position. It seems pretty thin at that spot. And I would pause and, and I might have done this too, to Kosh is like, you know what? It's sort of similar to keep taking defensive linemen. And now I get it. Defensive linemen are, you know, they're thoroughbreds. Like the great ones are just great in every system. It's not schematically inclined as much as that guy's just going to beat the guy in front of them. But they do just keep taking defensive linemen. Like they do do that. And it's not like they're taking studs every single time. They just take them because they like taking them. 
again, I'm not arguing with them. I'm saying if you take that argument where it's just safe to take offensive linemen every year because no one will criticize you, it's sort of similar with def- it's sort of similar with defensive linemen. Yeah, when when he met with uh, John Lynch in 2017, I think it was in Atlanta, and, and uh, Jed and Prague are interviewing them. Um, you know, uh, John and Kyle really didn't know each other very well. I think I think that's a, a misconception that a lot of people have that they had some sort of deep relationship before they started working together. They talked a couple of times with you know in John's capacity as a broadcaster, but that's it. And what really sort of connected them is they spoke about, you know, the the two positions that are most important to them on a roster. And they both agree that they were quarterback and defensive line. And um, that's why the the marriage worked. And um, I think Jed and Prague were sort of fooled a little bit that they just assumed that there was a deeper kind of connection there than there actually was, but the connection was so immediate um, because they were on the same wavelength on a, a big important topic like roster building, like that one, that um, uh, they fooled them. And well, it's, uh, <laughs> and it's worked, uh, it's worked well ever since. There was a Mike Shanahan tie there too. Now, I mean, it wasn't Kyle, but he had played for Mike Shanahan. So I think he there felt some, they could talk about similar concepts similar you know kind of big picture but it, they, had the, they had that thing right, where that exercise where you put chits into like what chits how many chits would you put on each position right and they both put a ton on defensive line be curious where they where they ranked offensive line in that chit system. <laughs> no <laughs> like chits. zero you're putting no zero chits, chits? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, about your negative chits here uh but uh it, yeah they believe in the defensive line i'm not i love teams that are built around defensive lines i just think those are physically impressive teams because you can dominate the run game on the offense and you can d- dominate the passing game with a great defense line. You just can't. And that's Kyle's thing. Like they just go overwhelm you in practice when it's Bosa and whoever else, they can just destroy the first team offense. Sometimes they can. And I get no other position is like that offensive line, you know, Harbaugh's line as it affects all other things. And I agree with Harbaugh on a lot of things, but I get the lean towards defense. And Harbaugh certainly wouldn't argue against the defensive line either. But uh, I just think if you want to understand what the 49ers are doing and why they do it, um, that's, a, that's a conversation I'm going to refer to many, many times. That offensive line conversation. I just really – those are why I do these, do these shows. It's just I want to know these things, and I get them in a situation where they're happy to talk about them, and it really, really it kind of enlightens – our understanding it, it fills in our understanding of these important people you got anything I, else oh, go ahead well i i said i'd love to see a a still photo of those chips and, and <laughs> where those chips ended up on both of their little uh diagrams that they had uh i think that would be very revelatory as well i think in what we what you've heard back is jed and parag were stunned how similar they were right they both did it so, you know you did it separately you didn't do it together and they turn it in. It's just like what ninety-eight of a hundred, or both, both of them are on the defensive line. It was something like that. I mean, it's like a date, exactly. it's, yeah. it's like a dating game show where you <laughs> go into a uh, secret compartment and you have to say what your your mate thinks uh, is like your favorite movie. And your the dating game? Movie. Like, are you that old where you know that in the dating game? Oh or yeah, newlywed, the newly, game. newlywed game, newlywed game, newlywed game. Yeah. The, 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 those that's like a long time ago there, Barrows. Way to go! But it's lasted eight seasons now for these guys. And yeah. Hey, yes, it was it's, not- a, it's, a, it's a union um, that uh, that 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 formed on that day in Atlanta, and it's gone strong since then. And guess who was uh, waiting at the door when I was finishing up with Kyle yesterday? John Lynch. John, like somebody's making noise, whatever. Like it is interesting. Kyle's office is right there on the corner. We know, like the players are walking out, and there's Kyle's office is just right there, windows, whatever, right on the pra- off the practice field uh, in the old building, and. The, you know, there's there's like a not assistant right outside, but you can like the doors close and you can hear everything going on outside. Like in his office, you would think they'd have some soundproofing or something for the head coach, Kyle Shanahan, going through film. But you can kind of I just want to hear noises and there's like like what is going on out there? And so we finish up. It's John Lynch was waiting outside the door. <laughs> like, ah, you can delay that one. Who cares? You don't need to meet about uh, any Brandon Ayuk stuff. I got stuff. I got to ask. Kyle about offensive line. Come on now. 
All right. We got anything else there, Barrels? No, uh, only that you were in position for a potential scoop there. If uh, John was coming to say, hey, we uh, we traded uh, Brandon IU to the Steelers after all. I could tell when he walked in that it was not that. <laughs> I could definitely tell. It was it was just a little, little uh, conversation, but uh, it's all good. Uh, again, I I do I work hard to get that booked, and I think at this point, Kyle's pretty well, you know, agreed he's going to do it every year, and it's a good conversation. I look forward to it. Hope everyone looks forward to it. It's on this feed if you haven't listened to it, TK Show feed, uh, and uh, I am glad you enjoyed it, Matt Barrows. Well, it essentially, it, it essentially gave you two podcasts: that podcast and, <laughs> and then the podcast talking about the podcast. There so. might be a third one or fourth one. <laughs> I don't know. I, I tell you, I might need to. I, the work I do to set this thing up is like is extensive. I'll put it that way: it's extensive. But uh, it's well worth it. I'm glad to do it. And hopefully uh, we'll set the stage for doing it next year. We shall see. Uh, Barros, we got a whole lot of training camp coming. And we might do multiple a week. I don't know. I'm not sure. But we won't be doing one for a little, at least a few more days. Uh, I do think news. Yeah. yeah, unless there's news. I think they got f- these four practices in a row. Tomorrow would be practice number two. And then they go Friday and they go Saturday. Sunday's a break. I think the serious stuff starts Monday, right? I mean – they won't put the pads on until Monday at the earliest. And I just don't know that Trent Williams will be in until then, even if he signs a deal. Um, I just think like, this is the ramp up, this kind of slow four day ramp up. And then Monday, Tuesday are going to be some serious stuff. I agree. And Pierce all like, you know, the, the guys that we're not seeing now, I don't think they're going to rush them in there this week and get them ready. Maybe the pads go on Monday. Uh, and not that they're going to be full out hitting full tilt, you know, they're not tackled to the ground, but it just gets a little more serious when the pads go on. Yeah, no, I agree. I think Pearsall will get eased in a little bit. He's not going to have a full practice on Monday, but we should see him at that point. All right. All right, Barrows. There we go. Good show. We'll, we'll see you guys next week. All right. Talk to you soon.